I'm Peter Brown from Tiny and Sons Glass. Tiny and Sons Glass was established in 1978 when my father and brother and I were at 575 Washington Street in Pembroke. We're certified and qualified to do all your windshield replacement and repair. Tiny and Sons Glass is a community-based business. We have 12 mobile vans that come to you. If the weather's bad, you can come here to the shop. We have a nice waiting area, TV, Wi-Fi, kid-friendly, pet-friendly. We also can move about 15, 20 cars a day through the shop. Perfect for you when the weather's bad. So come on down to Tiny and Sons Glass if you need your windshield replaced or repaired. Tiny and Sons Glass, 1-888-64-TINYS. Just call. Thank you. Good evening. Um, we have decided a while back that it would be a good idea for the advisory committee and the board of selection to get together at, at various intervals to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the three items that we um, I would like to discuss tonight are ones that we feel have some consequences for the town of uh, Pembroke, um, especially when we get to the pension analysis report. But due to what we perceive coming up as far as the buildings of in, in town with some of our public safety equipment, the compact has some um, implications for that. And also, we really need to get going on our five or ten year plan <coughs> so we're all in the same wavelength um, as far as, as what everyone sees as the direction for the town of Pembroke. Um, we're going to be changing our uh, mode of operation a little bit as far as the budget process goes uh, this year. Um, and then Ed will be doing the budget and meeting with the various departments. And we'd like to be on that schedule in case, you know, for when those discussions are. And then we probably will uh, invite a few, um, some of the bigger departments <coughs> probably. Um, because to more in-depth discussion of what, what their plans are. Uh, uh, for the for the 2018 2019 budget. Um, so with that, I'd like to start off with the um, community compact and what the status of that is. Mr. Chairman, we uh, I invited members, uh, various members of the advisory to uh, To uh, yeah, the committee that I formed uh, regarding the community contact program. And I'm pleased to announce that the first meeting is scheduled for the 4th, uh, and that would allow uh, both town accountant and the superintendent of schools to be available for that meeting. So that would be on December the 4th, Monday, December the 4th. Okay. So. For that particular meeting, I'm, I'm not going to be available. Uh, Steve Walsh and John Brown, mm -hmm. one or both may make it. Sure. Great. Okay. They have the representatives from, from the advisory committee. Um, does anyone else have any questions on that, or is that sufficient? That, okay. Um, so just for the public's benefit, <coughs> uh, maybe it's a question for Ed. Just speak to what the community compact is so that the, the public will be listening. Well, it's, pro it's program that the uh, the town would sign uh, on with the state of Massachusetts, and there are grant programs that are available from a public safety standpoint, uh, information technology standpoint, uh, land use planning, what have you. Um, I think one of the focuses that the town accountant and I are going to be looking at is uh, an IT grant uh, that I believe the grant deadline is going to be in the middle of January, um, and that will help fund the uh, uh, program that we want to set up, uh, a, a software program uh, in joint uh, participation with the schools. And uh, so we, that'll be one of the focuses that we have. But we'll be looking at the other aspects of the community compact program. It offers a, uh, uh, a wide range of uh, grant opportunities. This, this is a program that the state of Massachusetts is invo heavily involved in. And when the lieutenant governor uh, spoke to us, and I believe we are the only town in the <coughs> South Shore area that is not a part of the compact, uh, and at the present time out of the 351 towns, 
213, 314. 314 already are part of it. So we're a little behind the eight ball as far as that goes, but it does mean it opens us up to applying for grants and for a lot of um, funds that the town would not have to independently spend for some of the things that we have planned coming up. Now, next we'd like to know what the if, if there are any five and ten year plans for the town of Pembroke. We used to have a capital planning committee about four or five years ago. We had a, a plan. All the department had submitted uh, what they thought they would need in the future and it was put out on a grid. I haven't seen that for a long time and I don't know whether it is still being considered at all. Yeah, we still have the five year plan and it's updated on a yearly basis and I have that available for advisory. However, it seems like every year something jumps up to the top and and that becomes more of an emergency and we we tend to deal with the you know emergencies but we I that five year plan now I, another thing that you know, not only are we talking about a five-year capital plan, but this week, as we all know, there will be two strategic planning retreats that are going to be held. Uh, one Wednesday morning here at Veterans Hall for uh, department heads, and then Saturday morning here at Veterans Hall from 9 to 12. This is for uh, boards and commissions and interested uh, uh, you know, public uh, officials and uh, and, and uh, people in, in general. So we're probably going to have that um, established. You know, the five-year plan will be established that because it's been five years since we had the last strategic planning retreat. And a lot of the things that came out of that retreat have been implemented. Um, much the same as the DOR report. We implemented probably half of the 35 items that were uh, recommended by DOR. So uh, I think we're moving forward on that, and the, uh, the retreat on Saturday will, will go a long ways into formulating our plan for uh, the next five years or so. Ten years, it's a little, you know, a little far out, you know. Um, but uh, five years, I think, is, is doable if we can establish, you know, some kind of uh, a revenue situation where we can plan ahead as opposed to being reactionary on a yearly basis. Can I go a little further? So, also, you folks might have heard us speak of a capital funding study committee uh, a couple weeks <coughs> ago, and uh, we have some some language of the mission uh, that we're going to discuss uh, later on tonight about this. So, th this capital funding study committee, which uh, we need the advisory committees, uh, someone to be able to have a seat on that committee. They will be. So that committee, when, when I initially brought it up, was to look at uh, recent buildings, uh, the, the recent uh, asks for buildings from police, fire, and DPW. But uh, as we've been discussing it, it's morphed into uh, a, a permanent capital funding study committee so that it will be just that, looking into uh, funding for all future uses calling out from every department, school, BBW, fire, uh, what are you folks looking for in the future, the, the five and ten year plan? I believe that this committee will morph into that study and it will be a permanent seated committee with interested people who are going to focus on, on those projects and not only just take in uh, uh, asks from departments, but to to physically seek out from departments, school committee, what do you want? I, I need an answer from you. DBW, all that. So hopefully this this committee is an, is an active committee going going forward to to answer the question you just asked. Okay. I as as I think we all realize that we don't have the money uh, to do everything that we want to do. So therefore, we've got to prioritize. And that's where the community compact will come in if there are grants available, which of course would supplement anything that we want to do and at least give us a leg up um, on working with some of those things. 
Yeah, but then you, the committee you're talking about is, is something that's sort of necessary for after the uh, the meetings you have this week and Saturday. Right. It's you know to sit there and say this is what we want is all fine, but then how are we going to get there? That's the that's, that's the next and right. uh, a vital step in that planning process, which we're not going to accomplish Wednesday and Saturday. That's yeah. something that's going to be ongoing. Right, and, and, and Steve, as, you, as we all know, that's, that's something that hasn't always been there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so hardly awesome. ever been there. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, to be honest. <laughs> so, it, and, 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 and as, as far as the, the, the three buildings, yeah. for this committee, this proposed committee, uh, as far as the three buildings that are proposed now, I just want the, the folks out there to know, <coughs> especially advisory, some people in the DPW will pull me aside and said, is this committee going to have blinders and just try to find funding for the buildings that are in hand proposed? Not necessarily. That's uh, the, the police, fire, and DPW have spent money and time looking at their proposed new buildings. So yes, we will look to try to fund those as is, but we are also accepting, be accepting of grand ideas. Mm -hmm. Looking for, someone made, someone made a, a, a comment the other day, why don't you put the police and fire in the community center? Tear that building down and put them both right there. So these kind of ideas will not be, will, will be accepted and will not be thrown out of hand okay. uh, at this committee uh, as I'm chairman of it. So I'll have a little control over that. <laughs> Just I want people to know because I want people to be excited to be part of this committee. I don't want, so, I don't want, I don't want people to shun it saying it's never going to, nothing's going to happen. I want people to be a part of it and, mm -hmm. and, and want to help and contribute. And I know some of you folks do, so. I want to bring you folks and other people in. Get something done. That's what we're trying to do. Right. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, add on to what Dan said, is that this is a critical committee for this town. In the last several years, we have been uh, asking everyone to just live with the budget you had from the previous year. Finding funds has been the real issue here. We've got plenty of ideas, we just don't have the funds to follow through on it. And the time has come to end this. Um, we can only tax people a certain amount of money. And we all know that we could use more commercial in this town. There's a lot of good ideas on how we can get more money. But the point is, we haven't gotten it, and I don't know where we're going to get it, and I'm hoping that this committee is going to come up with some excellent ideas. I agree with everything that Dan has said. There, there are a lot of people in the community that have, have good ideas, but what we need is some of those people to come forward. We right now have two vacancies on the advisory committee, and I'm, I don't know how many vacancies there are on town committees. And it, it's, if the people of the town of Pembroke really care for the town, then they need to step up and support some of these committees that exist for whatever their passion is um, and try to move forward in it with whatever. A lot of things can be done without a lot of uh, capital, but uh, um, we just need the people to, to do that. Okay, with that, that brings us up to the pension liability and analysis report, which I'm going to turn over to uh, Tim because he was the architect of all of this. and. This is a budget buster, let me put it this way, um, when you see some of the figures that, that Tim will present. Tim? Uplifting introduction. <laughs> um, first, thanks, thanks for letting us talk tonight. Um, appreciate that. Uh, I do love hearing about um, talking about this kind of capital funding studies and um, all the planning we're actually doing for um, new developments in Pembroke, which I believe is kind of super important. Um, it's something you get excited about, and I, I've been saying for a while, it's I think if you use your imagination, the downtown of Pembroke area is really beautiful, so it's exciting to see um, some momentum kicking up there. Um, with that said, I, I think it's important that kind of what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, there's a lot of talk about planning for things that we um, we might spend money on in the future. Uh, I, it's important not to overlook um, how coming up with a plan to fund promises we've already made. Um, 
so that that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to talk about the pensions, the pension liability for Pembroke. Uh, in a little bit, I'm going to get into some of the, the health care obligations that the town of Pembroke has um, accumulated over the years and some thoughts about how we can begin to approach those. I think just as we're talking about a lot of the capital, capital planning that we're doing, um, the more planning we do around how to address this situation, the better it's going to be for Pembroke. I think even if you know we don't have to solve the problem immediately, but if we have a plan, we have a discussion about how we're going to get, um, how we're going to fund this, it will ultimately be credit positive for Pembroke, um, and that will serve to um, will be very beneficial when we go to borrow money for some of these capital projects. So, so Pembroke's pension obligation represents the guaranteed future payments that Pembroke's already made to um, retirees that have worked in the town. Um, and I want to impress upon everybody that it, it is the town's responsibility to ensure that these promises are, um, can be fulfilled and we want them to be fulfilled without undesirable outcomes for people living in the town right now. And by that I mean, you know, we don't want to have to raise everybody's taxes or lay people off that work in the town because the pension obligation becomes unserviceable. Um, you know, it's, it's important because I think this is something we've seen particularly in recent years that we continually face budget pressures and that's mainly due to um, increasing health care costs and the growing pension obligation. Um, and what we're seeing is particularly recently is this begins to start crowding out um, other things like some of these capital projects that um, matter to residents of the town. So I, I've shared this with the, with the board before, and we shared this at um, kind of a discussion we had um, earlier this, uh, this spring. This is what um, an estimate of working with Mike came up with, um, what the pension and health care cost projections are for the, the town of Pembroke going out over the next uh, 15 or so years. And you can kind of see that in um, the, the 2004 budget, that our pension and health care costs were taking up about 10% of our budget. Um, now we're approaching around 15 to 20%, and uh, it doesn't look pretty from there. Um, when we look out to fiscal year um, 2030, we're kind of approaching over 30%. So you can imagine how that's going to really squeeze some of the things that we want to do if this is what we're forced to pay. Um, and again, these are things that we have already promised, so it's important to keep that in mind. Tim, the that's percentage of the full $60 million budget? Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah, as you can see, going into next year, it's estimating it's going to be close to 20. That's double from 2004. So in, in just you know, 15 years, it's doubled its percentage of our budget. Um, so, you know. You guys, as, as correct, we, correct. If, if there's anything wrong up here, let me know. It's, so it's just... <laughs> But in, in terms of being able to uh, maintain the police and fire force and the school funding and everything else, it, you can see where we're getting squeezed right there. And again, I'm going to focus on the pension tonight. Um, the differentiation there will come back hopefully and talk to you guys about kind of the health insurance thing. The pension is a known cost. The scarier thing about health insurance is it's kind of an unknown cost. So um, you know, could that could be good or it could be bad. Um, so. It's, you know, it's important, again, like I said, we should really come up with a plan for how we're going to deal with this. Um, taxpayers, town officials, town and school employees, and retirees must be in a meaningful dialogue to address this problem as soon as possible. So hopefully that's kind of what we're starting tonight. Um, for Pembroke to responsibly plan for the future, we first need to have a firm understanding of our li largest liabilities. The pension and the health care liabilities are our largest. Um, and our effectiveness in fiscal health will be greatly improved by setting transparent and real, realistic expectations on what we can expect. So we talk about we're going to, we're coming up with a plan for all these capital projects. Kind of the first thing you do really when you want to assess anybody's health, it's like let's lay our cards out on the table, let's see what we owe currently, let's kind of come up with a plan to deal with that, and then we can kind of talk about the future. You breathe a sigh of relief once you see what's there. So since the beginning of 2010, despite outsized gains in the stock and, stock and bond markets, um, Pembroke's unfunded pension liability has increased 31%. So it's gone from 19.5 million to 25.5 million. So the unfunded pension liability is the amount of money that Pembroke currently does not have set aside for um, that it will owe, is projected to owe in the future. Um, and I just kind of wanted to make a note that the, the $25.5 million number is an actuarial liability, which is a little bit smooth and makes it look a little bit better, but that the real number is closer to $29 million that Pembroke um, currently has not funded for their, their pension obligations. So 
Tim, quick question. So that's the pension <coughs> unfunded liability. Uh, are there health care unfunded liabilities? Yeah, the, the, the health care ones are a lot bigger. Um, I think we've just, have we just done evaluation? I don't know what the number came in as, but. Yeah, it's one and a half times that. Yeah, so. Um, so what, about 40 million? <laughs> I, I believe that the figure we're paying this year for retirees' health care is in the vicinity of $2 million. That's out of our current budget for retirees right now. Yeah, I know it was and large. it's grown. I knew you'd, <laughs> I knew you'd want to answer it. <laughs> and it's grown. Well, it's important for, for everybody to know. You yeah. know, not only here at this table, but the folks at home. Yeah. Because uh, as eye-opening as, as that number is, uh, there's more to it than that. That's mm -hmm. right. Sure. Yeah. Um, so over the next 10 years, Pembroke will be expected to pay 64% more towards its pension obligation than it did in the prior 10 years. So from fiscal year 27, 2007 to 2016, Pembroke paid about $21.5 million towards its pension obligation. And based on projections from the Plymouth County Retirement Association, we'd be expected to pay $35.4 million for the next 10 years. So um, it's a lot more money. Um, so it's really something we have to think about. So it's important, I just want to talk a little bit about how you come up with an unfunded liability. And the most important assumption that a kind of retirement board makes is what their discount rate is going to be. Um, so the discount rate is basically saying, hey, if you owe um, $100 30 years down the road, you don't have to put $100 aside right now. But you have to assume that you're going to get a certain return on your money. Um, and based on that return, you back into a number that you would have to have set aside now. So 30 years from now, you owe $100. Say you're going to get 8%, assume you're going to get an 8% return on that money, maybe maybe today you only have to put aside $20. Um, and that gap is what we talk about when we're talking about the unfunded liability. So the, more, the higher the number you think you're going to re re get off your investments, the lower amount of money you have to put aside today. So if you think you're going to get 10% 10, 10 returns for 30 years, you have to put less money aside today than you would if you thought you were only going to get 4% 4, 4 retired, 4 returns. So I, I want to talk about this because I think this is really important where, so very small changes in that discount rate can result in massive differences in how liabilities are recorded. So the number that I shared with you earlier of a 20, $28.6 um, million dollar unfunded liability, that's based on an 8% discount rate. So the assumption that the money we set aside will earn 8% a year. Uh, if we were instead to assume we were only going to return 7% a year, that number would balloon to $35.8 million. So it's a 25% difference just by a 1% um, reduction in that discount rate. And this is what, I, what I, I really meant when I said we should really think about setting um, realistic expectations. Do we really think we're going to get 8%? Do we think we're going to get 7%? Do we think we're going to get 10%? Um, it's very, you can kind of see based on just the small changes here, it's a really important um, discussion to have. So currently, the Plymouth County Retirement Association manages money that Pembroke puts aside to pay towards these obligations. Um, and, and I would argue that for years, Plymouth County Retirement Association has maintained an unrealistically high discount rate, and it's actually one of the highest in the state. In 2015, um, the Plymouth County Retirement Association ignored a recommendation from the state's governing body um, when it asked to revise its discount rate lower so that it more accurately reflected expectations. Um, PEREC is the governing body that sent that letter to the Plymouth County Retirement Association. Um, and you can see here they asked them to lower it by almost 50 basis points, so a half a percent lower to more accurately reflect. Do um. you have a question? Sure. Uh, can you explain uh, your thinking on recommending uh, reducing the assumption further for 2017? That's not my recommendation. That's, that, that's a letter that the state sent to Plymouth County Retirement okay. Association. So the, the governing body of the state um, that managed that oversees all the publicly managed pension funds, PEREC, um, they sent a letter to the Plymouth County last year and they suggested that they lower that rate um, for this year. They were Which cooking the books and got, got called out on it. Uh, well, uh, well, in another yeah. slide or two, you'll see... <laughs> I said it, you don't have... No, in, in another slide or two, you'll see some of the effect that there, um, that this has in, in how it's creeping up on us. So if you wanted to actually look at what the numbers said, so for the past two decades, the Plymouth County Retirement Association has consistently come up short of its own projections. So the chart you're seeing here is 
Um, the black line would show you what Plymouth County um, Retirement Association's per assumed returns would be. And the red and green dots would be um, the 10 year rolling returns of where they came in. So by rolling returns, I mean, when you're seeing in the table on the right, you see 2006, what the actual versus the assumption is. Those returns are from the period 1997 to 2006. So 2007 would be 98 to 2007. So you can kind of see what the actual returns were versus what their assumption would have been. Um, and you can kind of see, so for no time frame in the past two decades, has Plymouth County Retirement Association met what their own assumptions would be. And it's actually been you know, significantly lower. So the average 10 year return over this two decade period is um, a little under five and a half percent where they've, their assumption has been eight and a half percent. Question? Sure. With that uh, example that you're showing with the consistency of overestimating, is there any oversight on with the <laughs> County retirement plan? With a record like that, wouldn't somebody be asking the question that you're asking? I'm here asking it. You would think that. I've asked it. <laughs> But um, I don't want to get too much into Plymouth County Retirement Association because tonight's more about Pembroke. So I'll kind of get. I, I just did. I did want to show this so we kind of understand how it's going, how it it's impacting our planning, um, and then we'll kind of make some suggestions on some steps that Pembroke itself could take. So this is this is one of the impacts. So this is the change over time in the Plymouth County Retirement Association 2018 employer contribution estimates. So every year, Plymouth County Retirement Association, they will give an estimate for what they would expect employer costs to be um, for 2018. So I basically just took, hey, in 2010, they had an estimate for what 2018 was going to be. In 2011, they had another estimate for 2018 was going to be. So here, I'm just kind of illustrating um, how that estimate has crept up over the past seven years. So in the past seven years, that estimate for 2018 um, for employer pension costs has increased by 37%. So that's where, um, that's where it really puts pressure on us if we're relying on these estimates um, when we see, well, we owe more for the pension this year than we thought we were going to. We owe more than we thought we were going to. It, this, this is why. Um, and this happens because they continually set unrealistic expectations for their own returns. And, and again, it's, it's the same thing that, you know, on an individual basis you may have heard in terms of the earlier you put money away, the better you are later in life. Mm -hmm. They are delaying putting the money away by that high 8% rate. So every year that goes by, they're increasing how much we owe. But they're doing it, you know, if they had done this before, they would have had us put up more money. But since it would have been earlier, it would have been a lot less money to us going forward. It's, it's, it's the, you know, if you put $100 a week away when, when you're 25 years old, you do that your whole life, you're going to have more money than if you waited until you were 60 and started putting a thousand a week away. You know, it's just the compound interest and everything else that goes with it. And what they're doing is they're going to force us to put the thousand a week away. And if, at some point, they're going to have to drop that rate at the same time that all of these other things have catch up, caught up with them. So we're going to get slaughtered all at once rather than if they try and if they drop that rate a quarter of a point now and a couple of years a quarter of a point, a couple of years a quarter of a point, they can ease it in. Uh, I'll say in, in Plymouth County's defense, they do so the state law would require the fund to be fully funded by 2040, I think. Um, so Plymouth County is setting a target for itself of 2030. Now, it seems highly unlikely they come up to that, but there is some flexibility that they have built in that they can push that date back. Um, but that just becomes, if we're relying on that, that's where it really is a challenge to planning because if they're going to move the date back, then it's longer that we're going to owe for it. So um, that's, that's really what we want to watch out for. We're just looking for ways to kind of transparently understand what we owe, um, set realistic expectations that would help us plan better. So when we rely on their unrealistic expectations, it kind of results in, well, hey, where, where are these pension costs coming from? When we see that chart and when we see kind of our budget getting squeezed by this, that, that's kind of what we're talking about. Uh, and the use of an unrealistic discount rate masks the true cost of the pension benefits and it encourages underfunding, undercontributing, and excessive risk taking, which threatens the ability um, of plans to pay basic retiree benefits. So to plan effectively, I think we need, as a town, a clear picture of the present and informed expectations of the future. And hopefully we're getting a little bit of that tonight. 
So this is this is important that the Plymouth County Retirement Association is unaccount unaccountable to Pembroke taxpayers and its elected officials. So they represent retirees of the system, which, you know, if I was a retiree in the system, I'm not, but I would I would be wanting to ask these questions. But again, tonight's more about Pembroke and Pembroke taxpayers and Pembroke officials have to be thinking um, as a separate body than Plymouth County Retirement Association. So we, you know, they're unaccount unaccountable to us um, as a town. So we have to, you know, we have to be careful on what we're relying on them for. Um, and we don't have to rely on them for a lot, really. So GASB 68 is a regulation that, was, that went into effect uh, about two years ago. Um, and what it is, it's requiring employers to record pension amounts in their financial statements. Um, and because the town is solely responsible for its financial statements, town management is responsible for the actuarial methods and assumptions used in measuring the pension amounts. So that discount rate that Plymouth County is using, um, I think I would be hesitant for Pembroke to just take that rate um, and accept it without um, documentation of how they got to that rate because, again, they're not accountable to us. The town is solely responsible for whatever method we're using to value our pension. Um, so I, I, I would... I would suggest that the town comes up with a methodology or a, a policy for um, complying with GASB 68. I, I have a quick question, and, and possibly Mike can answer this, is that whether our CPA firm has ever asked for this documentation, because when they put out a report, they're stating you know, th th uh, certain things, and I would think that they would be asking questions about where we're getting that number from and whether it's a reasonable rate. Uh, and how it came about. It's, have they ever asked that? Yeah, actually, I asked them. I asked them that today. In um, that previous slide, they said that's not true. Um, Gas Gasby said that town management is responsible for the this actuary methods and assumptions. However, because we have no control 